Mesdames et messieurs, bienvenue. Vous êtes de retour à, à la web diffusion du Congrès biennal du Parti libéral du Canada. Uh, we have the pleasure of having Jim Carr with us. Uh, you did a very, very inspiring speech today. Well, I mean, I could see in the audience everyone was uh, listening to you very carefully. One thing that you said that um, struck my mind was about the immigration policy. Yes. And, and you, you had a very progressive approach to that mm -hmm. in your own provinces. And I think for our viewers across Canada, it'd be interesting to hear a bit more about that. Maybe the best way to start is by telling you how I start some speeches in Manitoba. So let's say that there are a hundred people who show up at a community hall and I start to talk about immigration policy. I pose the question, so where were your ancestors in 1867 when Canada became a nation? So they think back and they go through the family tree and within 20 seconds they'll get 20 countries. So with the exception of our First Nations people, sure who were here for thousands of years, almost everybody will say that they came from somewhere else. Somewhere, yeah. So they came from uh, Ukraine, Russia, China, the Philippines, India, the United States, Germany. Uh, and then you make the argument, after we've established where everybody is from, sure. why our future should be any less dependent on welcoming people from all over the world than our past has been, and then you get your attention. And then the, what I didn't show is my favorite graph. Here's the graph. In those 10 years, when the immigration rate in Manitoba went from 3,000 people to 15, the unemployment rate went down. Really? And that is a myth buster. The unemployment rate down because those newcomers who came with skills and with a willingness to work sure. end up in their own houses within three or four years. When you're in your own house, you've got to do some shopping. Uh, and it's a, a circle of economic growth. And in the case of our province, anyway, it's been transformative and very exciting. So was it the provincial government that identified that as an issue, or, or was it from the grassroots that it was they a combination. recognized? It was a combination of uh, the federal and provincial governments. The federal government was a little nervous at first because they thought that if they allowed people to come to Manitoba, that many would stay for three months and then end up in Toronto, Montreal, or Vancouver. <laughs> that didn't happen. We like to think that's because once we get our graph on sure. them, they'll never leave. But in fact, and we've done studies, the proof is that most people have stayed, most people are working, very few are on social assistance, many are entrepreneurs, many are in the healthcare industry, many are uh, lawyers, doctors, accountants, tradespeople, right across the entire spectrum of the Manitoba economy, and not just in Winnipeg. That's interesting. They are also settling in places like Morden and uh, uh, southern Manitoba communities like Altona and Winkler, and adding enormously to the quality of life for everybody. So how did smaller communities attract immigrants as well? Because they already had communities of immigrants there, or they had people who spoke German, in the case of southern Manitoba, sure. Mennonite communities. Sure. So those who spoke the German language and were looking for places to settle they in went, Manitoba mm -hmm. naturally ended up where they were more comfortable more quickly, and those communities have developed and also have profited from immigration. Another thing you, you mentioned, which was quite um, interesting for me to learn, uh, coming from La Mauricie in Quebec, where we have a, a lot of First Nation, you know, in the north of the, of the riding, yeah. uh, you did something which I think a lot of us are thinking about, is how can you include the First Nation communities within the economy. Right. And I think you were talking about a grant program, you've started that to integrate these people, because oftentimes we're saying there's a, a fair percentage of the Canadian population which is not fully integrated within our economy, basically. And right. I think you've been doing something amazing. Why don't you share that with our viewers well, across Canada? We think the most important thing to do is to offer good educational possibilities sure. for Indigenous young people. And we do that after they have already cleared a number of hurdles. They've graduated from high school already, and our help is to get them through post-secondary education, and it's worked beautifully. But the real challenge is much before the time they get to university. And that's why we are big believers in investments in early childhood development. We have to do whatever we can to ensure that young people are born healthy, into healthy lifestyles, have the nutrition they need to be strong. It's very difficult to educate a young mind if that young mind comes with an empty stomach. So we have to develop communities with that as its starting and principal goal. And then later when we're developing resources, as I said, 
we will have to become partners with First Nations communities. If those resources are sitting on their land, why would we think that we can develop them without bringing them into the conversation in meaningful ways? Wow. We had a great conversation, uh, we listened in on Thursday evening between Larry Summers and yes. Christian Freeland and the importance of public investment. Right. Um, that we seem to be in an era where we're moving away from big government or there's a message that this is not good, but there is a role for government to play. Mm -hmm. And so can you explain your or comment on that, that particular piece? Well, there better be a role for government to play. In my own city of Winnipeg, we have about a $7 billion infrastructure deficit. And if you bring in the whole province, it's double that. So what would Canada's infrastructure deficit be? No layer of government can do it on its own. Yeah. Problem is that we don't talk to each other as Canadians. If the national government and the provinces and the municipalities had an intelligent conversation about what services are the responsibility of what level of government and what are their revenue sources that will enable them to pay for those services, we'd be doing something that hasn't been done for a very long time in Canada. Well, you made that point very powerfully when you talked about the last time Prime Minister Harper yes. actually yeah, spoke to the We need to provinces. talk to each other. So yeah. in, in Manitoba, is there good communication between municipalities and the provincial government? Does that happen in the it happens, it's, it's, uh, there's a natural tension always when you have levels of government talking to each other. And in the case of the way the Canadian system works, the city of Winnipeg is really an act of the Manitoba legislature. And the Manitoba legislature mm -hmm. decides what revenue sources are available to the city of Winnipeg and the other municipalities. So it's a paternalistic relationship. Maybe that has to be looked at again. But it has to be looked at in the wider context in Canada of what government is responsible for what services and how are they going to raise the money? How are we going to share the responsibility? Because this is an issue that cannot be ignored. If it is, we're not doing any favors for our kids and our grandkids. Jim, let us go to um, our online audience. I think that our community is, um, you know, we're interacting with thousands of Canadians, especially on a Saturday morning. And uh, part of our job is obviously bringing the convention to them. Right. from coast to coast to coast in Canada. So, André, tell us a bit what the community is saying to you. Uh, oui, certainement. Alors, uh, nous avons une question de Diane Dagenet, et je demanderai à nos animateurs de traduire, si ça vous dérange pas. Alors, uh, Monsieur Carr, vous avez mentionné dans votre présentation le besoin d'augmenter le niveau d'immigration et l'investissement en éducation. En plus de cela, quelles sont les autres mesures que nous pouvons prendre pour créer une classe moyenne plus forte? about uh, you talked about investment in education and yes. immigration what other measure can we do to increase our economy or to build our economy education immigration what other measures right innovation if we look at the example of uh, countries particularly in northern europe and the investment from both the private and sector on uh, research and development we look at ways in which national economies move forward with all sectors leading towards the same natural objectives. And that's why when you look at the index of productivity around the world, you'll find that it's uh, Finland and Norway and Denmark and Switzerland and Sweden uh, that often lead the way. And because those societies are organized in a way where there is a premium on innovation and productivity. And this has to be generated principally from the private sector in partnership with governments. We do a reasonable job in Canada. It's not good enough. There have been some recent studies published that show us ways of doing it better. And I think part of the national discussion that Mr. Trudeau will initiate, starting at this weekend's convention and then moving on from here, is exactly how we can engage the private sector in meaningful ways to stimulate wealth creation. Because we can talk until we're blue in the teeth about how much we think should go to education, to healthcare, uh, to culture. Sure. But if we don't generate the wealth, then there isn't going to be enough to distribute. And that means we have to create the environment within which the entrepreneurs can do their thing, and that's invest capital and create jobs. That's good. I think we have an, on our note question in our community on links matin, Christine. Certainement. Um, so the question is, how do we link arts uh, and business uh, to, to share our, our, our our talents here in Canada. We, we've discussed, for example, a lot, uh, you know, the, the importance of user interface, user design this morning with this, this component of art. Uh, so this is one of our, our community questions. How do you link arts and business? How we relate arts and business? Yeah, how do we, like, Christine, can you, can you just repeat a bit for, for Jim? I just can't hear it. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, the question is, how do you link arts and business. Uh, you, you've really had that experience uh, looking at your background. 
are important cultural industries in Canada sure. that generate lots of jobs and lots of wealth. Uh, the film industry, the music industry. Then we have a whole network of creative people who make cities more interesting places sure. to live. And uh, there's lots of been written about this. Most famously, I think Richard Florida, uh, mm -hmm. the American yeah. urbanist, who <laughs> talks about well, what are the most interesting places to live? And the answer is they are the places where you have the most creative people, the most artists. And an investment in art and in the artist is more than just an economic investment. It's an investment in the spirit of a nation. Sure. And to support the work and the creativity of our artists and our writers is absolutely vital to the fabric of who we are. And governments always should take that seriously. They should promote philanthropists and their capacity to contribute in the private sector to cultural development. It is what distinguishes us as people. So now you spoke to us about um, the problem with planning is around right. politics is that there's a four-year term. It's a tough one. It's a tough one. Yeah. <laughs> and yet we're making decisions, or we should be, as uh, you know, municipalities and provinces and the federal government for generations. That's so right. how do we how do we figure that out? I tough think one, huh? I, it's a tough one. Let's look at what we're facing in Manitoba right now. We're on the verge of uh, committing $22 billion to sure. building two dams in northern Manitoba, partially for the export market, partially for domestic demand. These dams will have a life of 75 or 100 years. So the decisions we're making today are important for nearly a century. Sure. But they're made at an economic and political moment in time. And at the moment, the energy pricing doesn't look particularly good for Manitoba Hydro because of the price of other sources of energy. But that's not going to last forever. So someone's going to have to make a decision within the next short while whether or not to invest $22 billion at a time when it's probably not politically popular to do so. Yeah. So what do you do? You get the smartest minds around you try to, to give do. you the best advice available yeah. and then you make a decision. Jim, we can have you on the show for a whole day because your, your speech was inspiring. I'm sure you inspired people at home across Canada this morning. Thank so. you for being with us. It's my pleasure. We look forward to having you again. Okay.